what you're reading it? Or? Oh. oh, that's your answer. Uh, we're live on YouTube. We're ready to go. Thank you. Thank you, Millie. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the New Shore Council. Wednesday, April 28th, 2020 meeting via Zoom. The New Shore Town Council. Millie, can we meet every? Can we mute everybody? Thank you, Millie. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Wednesday, April 28th, 2021 town council meeting. We are meeting in, uh, we are meeting via telecommunications pursuant to state of Rhode Island executive order 20-46 dated June 12th, 2020. If you would like to uh, raise your, uh, participate, you can raise your hand on your phone by pressing star nine and you can mute and unmute by pressing star six. I will ask everybody to stay muted until I see a hand up. I will call on you and it would be great if you could identify yourself and let us know what's on your mind. The supporting documents for this meeting are located on the Town of New Shoreham clerk base page. So with that, I will get right into it. I do wanna let everybody know, it seems as though there are a lot of everybody here. If you have any comments, um, we will limit them to two minutes. And um, when you're getting close to the two minutes, you'll be notified by the clerk. And if there's more time in the end, um, we'll be happy to give you more time if, if it's um, appropriate. So with that, we have one item on the agenda this afternoon and is an informational session and public discussion regarding the town's proposed acquisition of a portion of Plat 19, Lot 3, and a right of first refusal over a portion of Plat 19, Lot 3. I will open up the meeting. Um, by letting the, um, our town manager, Marianne Crawford, give us a rundown of the project. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Andre. Thank you, Marianne. So sometime uh, last winter, um, late January, February timeframe, the town council was approached by the land trust and both of Block, Block Island Conservancy Group, the uh, Block Island Conservancy and Nature Conservancy, uh, about the possibility of purchasing uh, a, a piece of property. The total acreage of the property is five point, currently is 5.71. There is a pending uh, subdivision of the property before the planning board. Uh, th the property that is being discussed is plat 19, lot three. Total acreage, like I said, is 71. With the pending subdivision, it'll be subdivided in lot to lot A, what I'm going to call lot A and lot B. Lot A is 1.59 acres, which includes uh, the motel. Uh, the lot that the town is working with the uh, land trust and the conservancy group to purchase is 4.12 uh, acres. The property that would um, be transferred to the town, sold to the town is about 1.75 acres. The land trust and the conservancy group will maintain 2.37 acres. On the 1.7 acres, the town in the future would um, build uh, what we're going to call a harbor master infrastructure. This infrastructure will include harbor master facilities, restrooms and showers, uh, employee living, storage for uh, paddle boards, kayak, and other recreational amenities, welcome facilities, docks, and ramps. Total purchase price is $10.5 million, with the town contributing $4.5 million, the land trust contributing $4 million, and the conservancy groups $2 million for a total of $10.5 also included in the purchase is the right of first refusal for three years. Exempt from the right of first refusal is if the property is transferred to Stephen Filippi, his wife, mother, child, or is at law. Um, the transfer, if the transfer does take place, the transfer of those um, folks that was transferred to will also be subject to the right of first refusal. Sale of the property with ballots um, can also take place. However, that sale is also subject to the right of first refusal. There are littoral rights uh, with the property that will be purchased. 
uh, the seller has agreed not to object to the town's wharfing out in the future, either from the property or from the Ball O'Brien property. The sale of this is subject to the financial town meeting, which is slated for Monday night. Uh, the purchase and sales agreement states it will not be signed until it will not be executed until after the voters approve it. Also, there is a clause in it. There's currently an appraisal done that was done back in July of uh, 2020 prior to the sa uh, sale of Champlain's. There is a clause at that um, the if we will not execute the purchase and sales agreement until an updated appraisal has been completed, uh, satisfactory to the town council. Um, and that's all I have to state at this point um, with the information um, to be presented to the folks that are participating in the meeting. Thank you, Mary Ann. Keith Stover, I see you have your hand up. You're muted. That was, uh, that was the most compelling thing I was going to say, and you just missed it. <laughs> um, I, guess, uh, um, I guess I just wanted to start out by saying um, that, uh, you know, I think all, everybody on the town council um, spent hours thinking about this, um, reflecting on it, um, and you know, uh, to be honest, I had I had a lot of questions. I did everybody else about, especially uh, you know, obviously the price is significant. The um, questions about uh, the extent to which uh, you know bonding four and a half million dollars has the potential to to you know crowd out other spending. How does it fit into our priorities? If uh, folks on the call probably remember that. Um, that uh, uh, <clears throat> several of us uh, on the town council <clears throat> before the budget even began <clears throat> wanted to have a, um, a conversation specifically about that, about our capital spending and, and uh, what our plan was. Uh, and um, uh, Amy Land and, uh, and Marianne uh, put together a, a terrific presentation, which uh, if you haven't seen it is worth going to YouTube uh, to look at. But, Here's where I came out on this after, uh, you know, after a long time, and frankly, after feeling kind of negative about it for for quite some time. Uh, and that's, first of all, um, uh, as much as we have an Andy's Way and a Mosquito Beach, uh, et cetera, what we don't have is, you know, sort of very high quality infrastructure uh, that gives residents easy access to the Great Salt Pond. Uh, uh, for the range of activities that one can engage in on the on the Great Salt Pond. Uh, you know, I'm to some extent talking about sort of the obvious things, you know, a decent harbor facility that's on property that we actually control, uh, but about, you know, other stuff. Uh, Marianne mentioned some of them. Um, the ability to uh, fool around on small boats, paddle boards, kayaks, you know, all that sort of uh, waterfront infrastructure that that many towns have now. Uh, one of the interesting things that the research uh, that that some of us have done, I think, is that is that this is not unusual to have this sort of uh, ready access for residents to a range of activities. Um, uh, and by the way, uh, people have these facilities, and they don't have our great salt pond. I mean, it is it is extraordinary, and um, I think we need to. Uh, uh, be serious about developing that that uh, infrastructure for our residents. Um, I'll say that uh, you know I could go on uh, and I'll, and I'll stop. But I but for me personally, as I thought about this, um, one of the things I really thought about a lot is you know why did I run for town council? You know, sort of like what what was the purpose? Um, and obviously, it's to get you know, the day-to-day -day things, right, uh, uh, to work with the town manager, to work with, you know, colleagues to sort of do the things that need to be done. Um, but to me, a, a, a big part of this uh, job ought to be uh, trying to lead on big things too. Uh, and 
this is a big thing. There is no doubt that it is expensive and that it is a significant decision. Um, but I feel uh, quite passionate about this. Um, and I feel quite proud uh, to live in a community that has done things like Rodman's Hollow, Hodge, the broadband project, you know, most recently. I mean, um, I was talking to someone recently and, and uh, you look at the vote on broadband and uh, it, what it indicates is that we are a community that is prepared to invest in things that are important. Um, so uh, that was my thinking and I really uh, appreciate the time and look forward to hearing, for, hearing from folks. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Any other counselors have any comments? Not yet. Any questions from the audience? I see a hand up. It's 401-497-5181. Uh, and then call in user one. I see you there. Uh, you can be next. So 497-741-8145. You can be third. Uh, so 497-5181, if you could unmute yourself and state your name um, and let us know what's on your mind. Andre, David Lewis for the record. Hi, David Lewis. So I have to, I will acknowledge right up front and that, that uh, having read all the documentation that's online, I saw enough of the appraisal to tell me that the numbers are within reason, which is all one can expect in the current real estate market. But everything else I've looked, over, looked at with a fine tooth comb and I'm, most of my questions have been answered and I'm ready to pull, throw my entire weight behind, behind the financial town meetings vote to approve. Um, a couple of points I would make out, I would make to begin simply as part of my comment. I do have other questions that I'll have to come back and ask about later. Um, <clears throat> You know, this is all about planning for the future and not necessarily for people of my generation, but it's people younger than me. And this town should, should bear the responsibility of allowing the future to be adequately provided for for future generations of Block Island residents, plain and simple. And this falls into that category. And, you know, we've done other things in this community that are dramatic, that are, that point point to precedent for having made important decisions that were costly at the time, and we look back and look at, and are thankful we did them. And we don't want to be in that same position on this topic. Specifically, I refer to um, the, having purchased about 10 or 15 years ago the land, the waterfront land out in front of the National and in front of uh, the, uh, what is now Salt and Pepper, Marsha Phelan's street front building. You know, we spent a lot of money on that, and it's a purchase that we will never regret. Same thing with the Hodge property. Same thing with the purchase of BIPCO, which, even though it was a very close vote, I think many people who voted against will now agree that it was not a bad decision. Um, so we need to view this project in the same context. Um, it also provides a lot of important things that... Now, don't necessarily jump out in front from the appraised price, that the appraisal that was written about. Um, that I didn't realize it was back from last June, but I knew it was ne not necessarily current. It's Number one, up. the water rights that are being granted, that's not necessarily recognized in the public domain as something we're getting with this purchase of money, with this money. The right of first refusal over the overlook property in perpetuity, um, you know, that's not, that's a secondary benefit for which we probably paid very little money. And I think I'm being told that my two minutes are up. Yeah. And if you have, um, th this is an information session and in public discussion. Um, and I suppose that's public discussion, but if any of the public has any comments as to um, whether they're for the project or not, I think, you know, we only have an hour and a half at this. So I think you can reserve those for Monday night. I will, uh -huh. I will put my hand up later to ask my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. But you. Uh, go ahead, Martha. I mean, David, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Martha, go ahead. 
I apparently was muted before when you asked council people to speak because I feel that it's important that it be clear. And to, first of all, I thought this was an information meeting. I didn't think this was going to be a lobbying filibustering meeting. Um, that this was, this is being put before the voters next Monday night. It was a three, two vote on the town council. Uh, I voted against it. I think there are so many things this town needs so badly that if we're talking about future needs of this community, I think housing is a whole lot more important than second, third, fourth, fifth place to launch your kayak, with all due respect to all the kayak folks. The the price is high, the price is high in everything we buy. And I you know, I don't want to go go there. But I, I guess I think it's really, really important that everybody look at this from the broad picture. If everything else were in place, if we knew the figure on the power company, the final figure, which we don't know, if we had the Coast Guard station on a real track, if we had, didn't have the housing year-out crisis that we seem to have because nobody is even making any effort at being marginally uh, generous, but it might be a different circumstance. But I really think everyone needs to think about this, not just for looking at, oh, let's have a lovely summer day on the pond, but what we need is a viable year-round community, year-round. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. I can't agree more. I think what, you know, um, you know, the, the future to be adequately provided for, to me, is housing. And um, right now, and that is our biggest thing. And one of the reasons I voted against this was because of the amount that it adds to the taxes. I mean, we have, we have you know, legacy families here who, whose children are, you know, still here, but, um, you know, their taxes are just going to keep going up and going up. And when are we going to get to the point where they can't afford to live here? Uh, because of these projects, um, I think that um, we have everything is like Martha said, I think we have places to put kayaks on the end of Andy's way. Um, but I, I'm not too sure that this whole project is actually about a boater's facility. I think this is about open space. So, um, I mean, as Keith said, it's four and a half million dollars in bonding for the town, but if we look at it as a whole with that facility there, with all the money everybody's putting into, it's $13 million. So, um, and I, I think it's very important that everybody knows the actual price tag of the actual plan for the property. The town is bonding 4.5, but the actual price of this whole plan is 13. So um, that's just one of the reasons. I do have a comment is, um, all right, call in user one, I see on here. I don't see a phone number on that. So I don't know who that would, who I would even be calling on. Call in user one. Clerks, can you help me out with that? I've asked them to unmute. Okay. I can't identify them either. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, you're unmuted. If call in user one, if you'd like to identify yourself and let us know what's on your mind. I will go back to call in user one. I see a hand up at 741-8145. Um, if you'd like to unmute 741-8145 and let us know what's on your mind. Good evening, Andre. How are you doing? Good. Ken Lacoste. Ken Lacoste, High Street. Hi, Ken. Hey, Andre. <laughs> um, thank you for thank you for allowing the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, you miss for us? The first time you miss in, us? I, what? You miss us? Oh yeah, every chance I get. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Don't waste any time. Go ahead, Ken. I appreciate your call. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, for the first time, I find myself in an interesting situation. The first time in 18 years, I'm going to be on the uh, on the floor of the financial town meeting instead of on the table. So, I'll save my comments and and um, editorials for that for that night. But right now, I have a question about um, one thing that jumps out at me in terms of the use of the property is there's a lot of um, activities listed for the um, for use by the harbor master or harbor's infrastructure. 
um, including showers and living and storage and docks and ramps and storage of kayaks and things like that. I'm just wondering uh, how much planning has been done and how much actual practical mapping out of all these uses has been done in order to justify the um, the claim that these that this property 1.75 acres can be used for all this stuff. Uh, as far as I know, none. But if anybody has another answer that would be better than that, um, we're listening. Go ahead, Sven. Andre, this is Claire Costello. Can you hear me? Yeah, hang on a minute, Claire. Sven's got a question. Yeah, I was Sorry. just going to, uh, uh, in addressing the question as to layout, I do know that there's been uh, conceptual sketches. Uh, right now, um, the 1.75 is is not defined exact locations of that 1.75. What I mean is, it's not uh, set that it's you know uh, the coastline up. Uh, it could actually be a little bit of an amorphous shape because as you, I think many people know, there are some wetlands in there. There's obviously CRMC buffers, <laughs> things of that nature. So exactly where that 1.75 is 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 very intentionally. Uh, a little bit liquid so that uh, it can be designed uh, to Ken's question around how is the harbor master facility positioned, where is the dock, where is the ramp, uh, potentially one, you know, one in theory could be over on the Ball O'Brien property, a, a ramp could be there, the dock could be on uh, this lot A. So there have been a number of sketches that I have seen at least where people have looked at building size and from a development point of view, lot coverage, there's, a, there's um, at a sketch level, ample space, uh, but it has not been documented until um, uh, it's actually real. Hopefully that helps. Sven, where are those sketches so the rest of us could see them? I, I, saw, I, I saw a couple um, in that I think, uh, Rosemary or somebody was developing or trying to develop just because the question came up. Um, I will get those out. I will make sure they're out. I don't, I don't even know who owns them. Uh, so I'll get that out. Thank you very much. And, and I'll it, get that to Marianne and it can be posted up on, on clerk base. That's thank you. Right. And to the point, I think it's really important for everybody to understand is it's not just the purchase and sale agreement. There's also a maintenance agreement on there. Yes. Yes. Um, we had gone to the land trust and asked them during one of these meetings, you know, where they wanted their easement. And they came back and said on the whole property. So it's not like the town. Our, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it's not like the town owns this property outright. It has to go to the land trust for permission to do everything um, that on that 1.7. Um, and we had a meeting on Monday uh, with the land trust to settle things before we came to finalize uh, at six o'clock last Wednesday. And um, some um, additions were made to that. Uh, that basically would, would, that would basically also cover the structure. Um, so not only is the land trust have an easement on the town, uh, on the property right now, they're actually is an, a, an easement over any structure that would go over it. So to me, um, that completely, it further ties the hands of the town of doing anything down there. So um, that was one of the reasons why um, I voted against this. Yeah, thank you, Andre. I, I, that was my concern is that, it, like I said, I, I, I can't agree more with the, app, with the idea of, of saving proper, of saving access to the Great Salt Pond, but I'm just leery of, of how much could actually be done on, on a two acres that's surrounded by conservancy land and has other buffers and everything involved and, and whether or not um, what's being um, suggested is, is a little bit of overreach in terms of what could actually be used for. So thank you, for, thank you for taking my call. Thank you very much, Ken. And I will say that I will, I do, and another part about that is, you know, uh, you know, small boat launches and kayak ramps, I mean, if you really look at that area, you'll be launching kayaks straight into the main navigation channels. And this has not been discussed, um, but I mean, it's a reality. If you have kayak storage down there and you're launching from that area, you know, you're going to be launching it into a commercial zone. And I'm not sure that's actually safe. 
Oh. And launching power boats into a rocky area of the harbor, too. So, I mean, I know the area. So, anyway, thank you for taking my call. I'll sign off. Ken, can you answer me one question then? I did have a question about that myself. Is How deep is the water over there? Well, obviously, if you're on shore, it's only a couple inches deep, but 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 it it gets it gets it gets deep very gradually over there, and and it's a rocky, rocky, um, rocky area, you know, right out right out into when until you get out into about uh, eight or ten feet of water, out by the first moorings, um, especially a little bit more to the east and and around the corner there, but it's it, it's pretty rocky in there. You can see the rocks up on the shore below the uh, the southern end of Champlains, and you can see the rocks on the shore. If you walk the beach between the two marinas, you can see it pretty clearly. So you'd have to get pretty, pretty good far out. That's the, that's why the, the beauty, although it's a pin in the butt, the beauty of the, the launch ramp at, at, at you know at Bimmy is that it gets deep pretty quickly. So you you know you can get the boat, the bigger boats and, and boats in the water without too much problem. So um, that might be problematic to use it as a, as a launch ramp for for boats. And also you have to think about how the boats are going to get through the water if you're trying to launch a boat on a trailer. You know. You got to have space to turn around and then back down, and then what do you do with the trailer and the, the truck when you're when, when the boat's in the water? So um, I'm not sure that that's one of the uses that's probably being touted for the for the for the property. Obviously, we need a, a, a space for the harbor master's office unless we come up with some sort of a public private, you know, um, partnership, um, and we need a space for harbor's activities that isn't maybe that isn't all the way down Coast Guard Road, but that's that's an inconvenience, but but it's it's certainly a, a wonderful area. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's somewhat rocky there to answer your question. I'll sign off. Thank you, Ken. Much appreciated. Um, call in user one, if you can get unmuted. I think that was me, Andre. Oh, okay. Uh, Go ahead. Um, thanks. So it's Claire Costello. And I, I just wanted to um, say with regard to sketches and so forth, the Committee for the Great Salt Pond in the late 80s, early 90s commissioned uh, a planning study, which we did for the town, and I know that copy is kicking around, and it explored all sorts of shoreline access and um, and potential locations for such a facility. Um, and obviously it's dated, but, you know, the information is still relevant. And what it did was it took into account all the, the needs uh, of the boater community as well as potential shoreline sites. So there's something to work with there. But I, I just wanted to get clarification on a couple of things. I mean, this keeps being referred to as a kayak launching ramp. Um, and, and my understanding is that this is a full-on harbors facility with showers and toilets and info center and, har and harbor master shack that's been, you know, in violation for years and years, uh, potential housing upstairs and so on and so forth. Um, so I, my understanding is it's much more than that. And, and this has been an unmet need for, you know, 40 years and counting. Uh, I, I think it's important to remember that the pond is an enterprise account. And we need to feather the nest for the goose that lays our golden egg here. And I'm just wondering what the alternative location would be and whether you all have looked at this proposal against other options, because I don't know that there are any at this point. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of disgraceful to offer this boater population two toilets and a dumpster at smugglers. And so I think it's, it's time to consider you know, what we're not offering rather than, you know, what are other priorities? I do think it's a false choice to hold us up against housing. This was never about housing. That notwithstanding, the, the, my understanding is the conservation partners were thoughtful and strategic in holding out the development rights to apply them and allocate them elsewhere precisely for housing. Um, and lastly, I'd like to say that I, I think it's, it's, it's a bit inflammatory to suggest that because this is going to be under the ownership of the conservation partners. There are upteen examples on the island of where conservation and the town have worked very well together, both owning and managing joint properties. Ball O'Brien Playground is a perfect example right next door. So I, I think the distortions that are being kicked around by misquoting what will be on the taxpayers to, to sport, the 4.5, not the 10.2, um, I, I think we have to be really clear and clean about how we talk about this because the, the needs and of the town are, are unmet here, and I'm not sure what the alternative is. This is not a kayak launching ramp. This is a full-on boater facility, which has been lacking in this town for decades. Thanks. Okay, but I will say again that to fully realize a boater's facility, the total cost to the town is $13 million. And my priority is not a $13 million boater's facility on a piece of property where the town's hands are tied um, it is housing for our employees, housing for our year round population. And I mean, I just, I, if we're going to spend money that way with that kind of money, 
you know the problem we have with housing. So I guess it's my, it's not my, this is not my priority right now. So- But is it a housing project that's competing yeah. for at the moment? I, I don't know. I mean, I, you, you're putting it up against a housing project that I, I don't know to be in the offing. Um, and, and the town is gonna be paying $4.5 million here. So can you help me understand that? Yeah, I can. If we were going to spend, I can tell you it's simple. If we were going to spend $4.5 million on anything, I would put that into housing. But is there a project that this competing with right now? In other words, is that, a, is that in, the, in, the, in the wings? Well, I think, I don't, yes, it is. To answer, your, to answer your question, yes, it is. It's not fully vetted out. We have, many, we have many options on housing, but we need money for that. And the money that if this is allocated for this will compete with that because this will raise the price of your taxes. I think it's been put out $137 a year um, on a million dollars. And that's not even taken into consideration what the actual 5.9% of the budget is adding to your taxes already. So what I'm saying is that we don't have broadband online yet that we're paying taxes on. We don't have the high street project that we're paying taxes on. Um, we have, this is only $137 added to 1 million, but there's a lot of other items on there right now that's going to raise your taxes pretty considerably. And I just don't think that personally, I don't think that this is, um, a priority for me to put into that, um, mix. Can I ask one other procedural question? Yes. Um, the council has voted by majority to put this on the warrant. Do you all then speak with a single voice when it comes to the town a financial meeting? In other words, does this get presented as a town, a council endorsed item? A majority of the town council has, has um, approved to put this on the warrant, but um, I think the people that spoke in, in opposition to it can actually uh, raise those oppositions to the public anytime they want, whether at a financial town meeting or at this kind of a meeting. I just did not know whether or not the will of the council being that to, to, to promote this and put it forward um, w required you all to speak from that vantage point. Well, even if it did, you know me. <laughs> At any rate, Martha, I believe yep. you had a couple of comments in here. You know, I, I just want a point of, uh, point of clarification here that the harvest facility is not part of the money that is going to be voted on Monday night, all we're talking about is a site, a potential site for a harvest facility. The practicality going forward is, uh, Ken Lacoste outlined, I think is, is relevant, but the actual dollar amount for a harbor facility would be above and beyond the 4.5. And I think it's been estimated at 2.5, but that's not on, that's not included in what we're, we're actually talking about. We're only talking about the land right now. Thank you, Martha Ball. 401. The other, the other would have to. I'm sorry, Martha. Are you? No, you say the other would have to come later. Let's not confuse it. I'm going to move your square up um, so you're here. Um, Marcus, you got a question, but I got um, 464 2231 and then Mark Emanuel. 464 2231, if you can unmute and identify yourself and let us know what's on your mind. Four six four two two three one. You can unmute by pressing star six on your telephone. I will come back to four six four two two three one. Mark Emanuel, go ahead. You're muted, Mark. Mark, you're muted. Okay, Andre. When you talk about housing, that is what I call a motherhood issue. No one can debate it's, it's, the need it, for it's, it's Kristen. It's Kristen Bauman. I'm a resident of High Street. I believe I'm unmuted. Is that correct? 4642231. Is that Kristen Bauman? Oh, I can't tell if, am I unmuted? Yes, I'm just, yes, I can't. In your boxes there. Okay. Mark, you want to let Kristen? Okay. Yes, by all means. Okay, uh, go ahead. Okay. Okay, it's hard. It's hard for us uh, out here without you because we get delays, and I'm on my phone, but watching on YouTube. So apologies. But um, uh, my my question, as this is an informational meeting, um, is about the money, and um, 
we were told, uh, or it was made a comment, uh, the question was asked by Martha Ball, Councillor Ball, about uh, the land trust and the money for it, and we were told that the money was in cash. And so I'm curious if the money's in cash, and if that's true, do they need us to participate in this purchase? Could we just let them make this purchase? It's in cash, potentially they could borrow the rest of it. And in that case, do we feel confident if they made the purchase and were able to do that about this public-private partnership, could we still put something on the land? And for clarification, I'm terribly confused about this housing issue. It seems that there is to be no housing on this property with an easement over this property, but yet we keep hearing there's housing to be planned for this property. So I'm hoping for clarification about the housing question, uh, the money, do we need to participate to save this land? Can they do it on their own are my questions. And then my final comment at this time would just be to Andre's comments before about generations of Islanders having to leave and not being able to hold on. Um, I am that person. I am looking at leaving Block Island because I can't hold on. So I didn't even have to go another generation. It's only been 25 years. So that's my comments. Thanks for taking them. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, much appreciated. Marianne, can you answer those questions for Kristen? Um, I think I can address a couple of them. First of all, the, um, the land trust is um, contributing $4 million in cash, and the other Nature Conservancy group is, is contributing $2 million. Um, if the land trust was to buy this outright, um, I'm not sure how much cash, cash they have, but any kind of borrowing for the land trust does come through the town, so there will still be an authorization or a request for authorization for a bond issue for anything above and beyond the cash that they have available. Not sure if that answers her question clearly. Um, and the housing that she speaks about is the housing that we intend to include in the Harbor Masters infrastructure for staff, um, so that addresses the housing. Kristen, are you good? You're, you're muted. If you have a response. So how the bonding works with the trust, they be bonded and then they reimburse us each year for the amount of the principal interest. I think we've seen that in the budget this year already. Kristen, if that didn't answer your question, you know, you can raise your hand, you'll have more time later. Um, Mark, you can continue. I just don't want to dilute this conversation on this specific issue with the uh, broader issue of housing. I consider that what I call a motherhood issue. It's undebatable. We all know we need housing. If I didn't step in, you know what, 25 years ago, I wouldn't be here today. So I understand that fully. But I want to stay focused on this particular issue. Now, Keith earlier spoke about the benefits, uh, the benefits to uh, residents on the island. I agree with that, but I give a different perspective because in the summer months I drive a taxi. And when that person gets in my car, especially down in New Harbor, they're subjected to more questions from me than they ask and, and then uh, they ask me, because I want to know their likes and more importantly, their dislikes. And they want not a luxurious facility, but they want something as opposed to what Claire called before as a, a couple of bathrooms and a, and a shower and a, and a dilapidated facility, an old barge. And we, we've got to provide that. It's just it's just basic needs for our guests when they come in, considering the revenue that that pond generates. Now, the PPPs that, that Ken spoke of, uh, the private partner partnership, fantastic, private public partnership, fantastic idea, but how many decades have we been pursuing that? Whether it's the K and H property, the Orb property, the Champlin's property, it's been sadly unsuccessful. 
So now we have an opportunity. Is it a ton of money? It's an obscene amount of money as far as I'm concerned, but it's an opportunity we can't really lose. And with that said, I'll go back to what David Lewis said. As I went back and forth on this issue for months, my final decision maker was simply what would Captain Rob Lewis do or what would John Brotherhood do? And at the very least, they would send it to the voters to make this decision. Thanks, Mark. Um, it, it has been stated in some of the, um, the literature I've read, opportunity of a lifetime, generational opportunities, but we're facing that right now with Champlains and the Black Island Boat Basin because in the past, there's, there's, own, there's new owners there. So we could actually approach them and say, we, we could give you X amount of money to put these facilities in for us. And then we don't have to spend the money on it because showers, um, I'm not gonna argue that they're um, voter showers that they're, that they're needed. It's just, like I said earlier, the priority for me right now, and I am, you're, I am gonna bring this back to housing because we have a major housing crisis. It's been in the newspaper, we can't find um, uh, housing for, for our help. We're going to have um, employees coming in. Um, if you look at the teaching staff up at the school, when all those teachers retire, they're already in legacy housing. Where are the teachers, when all the teachers retire at the school now, where are the new teachers going to live there in the future? Um, and $4.5 million is going to be um, saddled on the next generation um, for 20 years. So again, it's just not my priority. The public-private partnership, you know, I think the opportunity of a lifetime is right now to go to the marinas and say, um, this is what we would like. We would like an office, we would like you to put, and then let the, let the private sector pay for the showers or charge for the showers, because this is something, this isn't gonna make us money. This is just gonna cost us money. Um, and, I, and I get that's probably not a popular thing to say right now, because we seem to be stuck in these this vicious circle of fighting these people um, when we haven't even talked to them about this. We just want to fight them. And I, and I will go out on a limb and say, I think this whole project is just to stop the people who bought the Champlains from getting bigger in Old Harbor. So it doesn't need to be said. I just said it. None of you have to say it because I really do think this is the fundamental reason the environmental organizations are before us. And I would like to say that I have read the Conservancy's newsletter um, that they sent out yesterday to looking for support for this. And there were some inaccuracies in there. One of them is it identifies uh, Sam Peckham's as um, affordable housing. It's not. There's 10 units in there that are affordable. Um, and the rest of it is, is on the open market. Um, and another thing too, is like it says in there that we're, we're, a port authority could be put in there. A port authority, if you read that, that uh, plea from the, I say plea from the conservancy organizations, has never been discussed at any one of these meetings. So when you read that, um, your first warden has no idea what they're talking about. I don't know. I mean, are you gonna put a ship in there? I don't know. So um, I think that needs to be said. Uh, quick rebuttal. We're going off course a little bit there. I'd like to see a uh, bike pass out here. They cost money. I'd like to see deer eradication. That costs money. We gotta stay focused on this particular issue and the pros and cons of it. And I'd like to hear more from everybody else out there. Go ahead, Sven. Uh, if there is anybody out there, I definitely want to key to them. I don't, don't see any hands up. Is that true, Andre? I do not see any hands up right now. No, go okay. ahead. Oh, uh, you want to do 8888, whatever that is. If you'll yield, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I just, I mean, I, this is for everybody. So yes, absolutely. 401-466-8883. Um, if you could unmute yourself by pressing star six, um, identify yourself and let us know what's on your mind. Four six six eight 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 three. We'll give you a minute. Go ahead. You're unmuted. Hi, this is Gail Hall. Gail Hall, thank you for calling in this evening. What's on your mind? Sure, thank you for taking my call. I haven't been able to um, find all the necessary materials on clerk base, but I'm working on it. But one question I had in regard to part of the due diligence process is, if I have this correctly, I think a 
archaeological survey or dig or some form of demonstration is necessary when purchasing property on the Great Salt Pond. And I'm wondering if there is a contingency in the contract for this, just in case some significant findings are are found, um, for lack of better words, and therefore it may and could this at all uh, disrupt some of these plans? It certainly wouldn't disrupt conservation, but it could disrupt um, any development purpose. Um, that was one question, and I had one other. I'm looking at the map, and I can't see what the pond frontage is. It looks to be quite narrow, and there seems to be wetlands up above. So, like Ball O'Brien, I wonder what, how accessible it really is when it comes to development and access, and and you know for the purpose of development. And then, lastly. I thought Ball O'Brien had been purchased for this Harbors Department um, project originally, but I know things changed there, and I just can't remember why. And I don't need that full explanation, but I just want to make sure that that property was fully uh, reviewed for that purpose and I thought was the original intent and that you know this would then substitute. I do think this is a very high price for my professional opinion, I know a price is hard to peg, and it's property is only worth what someone is willing to pay, but this is a really hefty price for four-plus acres of land, um, in my opinion. Thank you. And uh, Marianne, can you answer any of those questions for Gail? Um, I can answer a couple of them. It's my understanding with the Bull O'Brien property, it was looked at to possibly uh, wharf out there, and it was my understanding the drop was very steep. Um, with the purchase of this, there's talk about also possibly morphing out to Royal O'Brien and then coming on to this property. Um, regarding the archaeology survey, um, I am not familiar with the fact that we need to have an archaeology survey um, on any purchase of the Great Salt Pond. That does not mean that we don't need to do that. I'm just not familiar with that. And I would leave that, that to other folks who have more experience uh, here than I do. I am very familiar with the need of archaeology surveys being done on a number of projects, especially those with federal funds and things like that, and in another life and also out here. And I missed the last question she had, Gail had. Wetlands. The wetlands, um, th there are some wetlands that are delineated in buffer that is del delineated in the mapping. Um, what we would do with any kind of infrastructure that we put there is we'd work around uh, the wetlands um, and the buffer. There is a CRMC buffer on the map also. I think my other question was the width of the property down at the waterfront. Um, I think that is in somewhere here. I would con continue with folks, Andre, and let me look for that because I thought I saw it somewhere in one of these uh, documents. Chief, go ahead. Marianne, I'm not sure whether the map shows it, shows the extra, uh, uh, the additional water rights that, that we were purchasing from the Overlook property, which I think, uh, I don't know whether that made a map, but it's a good question. And I have to say, Gail sent a detailed uh, list of questions uh, to the town council, and I thought it was about the most thoughtful document we received uh, this week. It was terrific. So thank you, Gail. Um, is Bill Landry here? I think he is. I think he's the A3 18900 number. Yeah, his hand is raised. Bill Landry, thank you so much. Can you unmute star six? Bill Landry, you Hello. Are? Bill Landry, thank you for yeah. coming. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, through the Pleasure. during these negotiations, and I asked I had asked you to come so you could explain what could be done with this piece of property to us so we would know. Um, in these um, uh, negotiations, I think if, if you want to call them that, um, it was stated that three, um, three condo units could be put on that 
subdivided piece of property. Um, could you explain what kind of development could actually be put there? Yeah, the, the properties in the, in the New Harbor commercial district, uh, the residential use is a permitted use in the New Harbor commercial district, including accessory apartments. Uh, so I think, you know, number of units may be more of a, a practical space planning issues. Uh, the, the current owners uh, presented to the zoning board what they described, you know, probably accurately as the potential for six residential units on this parcel B uh, area. Uh, and that's that's certainly not not out of the question. So I, I do agree that there is potential for for some type of uh, residential occupancy, caretaker occupancy, accessory apartment type occupancy in that uh, proposed facility. Uh, the other permitted uses mostly incorporate by reference everything that's allowed uh, by the CRMC program in type three waters, which is the adjacent waterway. Uh, the, uh, the first 50 feet from the mean high water line is in the town's waterfront district that specifically allows everything that's allowed or, or has a policy of allowing everything that's allowed by CRMC in type three waters uh, and that carries over to the rest of the parcel because uh, as a special use permit use because anything that's permitted in the waterfront district is permitted in New Harbor commercial as a special use permit. And the, the type three waters are not only designated by uh, CRMC as having the potential for intense boating activity running the gamut from uh, access ramps, launching ramps to full-blown uh, marinas and all manner of uh, recreational and commercial boating, they actually encourage it. It's the, it's the one zone where CRMC affirmatively uh, supports and is, is encouraging further uh, development of those types of, of uses. So the, the menu of potential uses that we see in the background materials and that we've heard uh, discussed tonight are, in my opinion, all feasible uses subject to space planning. You know, there's been discussion about, about acreage constraints and working in access and those things, which I, I really can't address. But subject to the practical aspects, the menu of uses seems reasonable and feasible from a zoning perspective. There is some relief required uh, to even subdivide the property. It's identified within the purchase and sale agreement, and that involves a special permit from the zoning board that modifies some provisions of an existing approval that the seller has to have an in in the lower part. And the, uh, the transaction is subject to subdivision approval by the planning board. And my recollection is that the way the lines were drawn uh, in the last iteration of the plan actually clipped and included some of the driveway and parking areas that go along with the, uh, the uh, motel and in use uh, by the seller. So that, that line really needs some work. Uh, and the legal description in the purchase and sale agreement correspondingly needs some work because it's based on that plan. But those are issues I would expect could be reasonably managed uh, before the uh, zoning board and planning board. Thank you, Bill, much appreciated. Um, so you, when you talk about six residential un units on the upland side of that, what would that like, is, would there any be difference for condominium units? No, there wouldn't be. I think those could be, the, the six units that were proposed were actually six cluster residential lots, 20,000 square feet each with some corresponding open space. Uh, I don't see a, a, a multifamily condo complex likely there. I do think that a, a town, uh, a town owned or town sponsored uh, facility that has individual accessory apartments for caretakers or other 
other types of purposes are are you know more likely for a uh, a uh, you know, a three-unit residential. Now, if the town's interested in platting six residential lots uh, for affordable housing or whatever, that's certainly as feasible for the town as it would have been for the for the existing owners. Thank you, Bill. Does anybody have qu any questions for Bill Landry? Seeing none. Uh, 401-497-5151. Andre, it's Dave Lewis again. I do have a, 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 a question that probably is best answered by Bill Landry. So if one were to read this section on the water rights, Exhibit F, um, can you explain in layman's terms what the those water rights are that is part of this purchase for the town, and I'm particularly con I don't fully understand the, the distinctions between riparian, literal, and walking out rights. Can you okay, well, like that in layman's terms, Bill? Please. Sure. I, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, Great. The the uh, the the right of waterfront. Uh, the waterfront the waterfront ownership carries with it certain rights to wharf out. Uh, they the, the owner of waterfront property can wharf out to the harbor line. Uh, those rights exist whether you're on uh, a lake or on the ocean. Uh, and they exist in the same way. Uh, you have the exclusive right to wharf out. Uh, the geometry in which you can wharf out is usually dictated by a harbor line where there is one uh, and other considerations. If there's some type of a, a circular area that surrounds the property, there's, there's case law that dictates how those rights to wharf out can be geometrically uh, distributed amongst different owners where there's a curvature of the shore. But what's meant by those water rights, you know, doesn't give, wouldn't give the owner any more rights than they have under Rhode Island law to, to develop below the mean high water line, except with respect to the right to wharf out, which becomes pretty pertinent when you're in a zone that allows as a special use permit use uh, docks and piers and, and all manner of uh, uh, boating support facilities. Did, did you address uh, literal and repair, uh, literal rights there and I just didn't hear it? They're the same. L literal rights and riparian rights uh, are based on whether it's salt water or fresh water. But at the end of the day, they're both exactly the same. They, they really connote the right to wharf out. So, I, so my comment, my so, let me just say if I understand this correctly, my understanding of literal rights, literal the literal rights would allow the townspeople to walk left below the wharf below the high water mark onto the lot, what is the lot A shoreline, and be able to uh, walk freely and launch kayaks or paddle boards or even small boats so long as they can get them down that shoreline and use the literal right to use the waterfront from that point of view. Well, that's, that's not really a, a littoral right. That's a right that every citizen has uh, in the state of Rhode Island is to utilize that area below the mean high water line for fishing and and uh, launching of small boats and and sunbathing and and other activities normally associated with access to the coast that's something we have already with respect to that area below the mean high water line that won't change as a result of this transaction uh, under the current ownership uh, the okay. people, of the people of the state have the right to do all the things that I've just described below the mean high water line the significant thing that comes along with this sale 
beyond that is the right to wharf out um, into that space and, and out into the into the uh, below the mean high water line. Uh, that right to wharf out goes with the upland ownership, and that's the right that's really referenced in those uh, in those sales agreements. Okay, so I I take from that then the fact that they've cited those three phrases, those three words in the Exhibit F really comes down to walking out. It does. It doesn't add okay. or subtract to what the public's rights are in that area below the mean high water line. That's great. Thank you for that answer. Thank you, David Lewis. Um, it occurred to me, is Kate McConville, the Harbor Master, with us today? I am. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Hey, Kate. Thanks so much for being here. Um, is there any, the CRMC, did, did they determine the, uh, those, those issues in the Great Salt Pond? They did not. So, so riparian rights is still an issue and the harbor management plan is, has not been accepted by CRMC through this. And one of the issues was the riparian rights that they're still working on. So, that whole wharfing out has not been accepted by CRMC as far as I know yet, if that makes sense to anyone. It does. So what's the, um, uh, Sven, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, finish up. Um, so the implication of that is what? Kate. Um, I, I think that that that's going more towards people who want to put put out holes in, or um, but that that signifies a major issue as to what what is our right as we want to wharf out into the pond. Uh, that is our riparian right. Do we get the? Do we have that right to put a dock out into the pond? So are you saying and that, that as far as I know, that decision has not been made clear to me by CRMC. Thank you. Uh, Who's that? First warden, I, I don't know if I'm still unmuted. This is uh, this is Bill Landry. I think the, the only real way that CRMC addresses these issues, is someone would have to file an application for a preliminary determination for a for a marina uh, or recreational boating facility or commercial boating facility, uh, it, it is a, a use that they recognize as as a uh, an allowable use. But someone has to request the assent, uh, and the the wharfing out issue usually only comes up before CRMC, where there are competing parties that claim the right to occupy. Uh, the uh, area in which the, the wharves and piers are proposed. And, and that usually results from existing conditions uh, and unusual geometry of the coastline. They, they, in my experience, they, there have been few uh, cases in type three waters where CRMC has, has not recognized the right to wharf out by the riparian owner. Um, there are certain setbacks from other people's riparian rights that have to be respected, and those are sometimes the subject of dispute uh, before CRMC. Um, but they they do recognize the right to to wharf out, but they only decide how much the applicant can wharf out and on what terms and conditions based on how they adjudicate the application for the ascent. There's a, a marine perimeter that's established. Uh, of a certain size and activities are allowed within that area and you know what that marina perimeter limit is 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 de determined during the course of the permitting process at CRMC so i don't think anyone can predict with certainty how how the town would be able to wharf out and what size this facility could take on until they start to navigate that process but in my opinion it's unlikely that the right to to pursue an application for some type of substantial marina or or shore facility there is 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 likely. Thank you very much, Bill. Kate, do you have anything to add to that? 
No, I don't. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Kate. Andre? Sven, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I will not take too long on this, but I, I would like to bring up a couple of points. First of all, thank you, uh, Marianne and everybody for having this meeting. I know it was somewhat last minute, uh, but I think it's been a really good opportunity for everybody to talk. Um, uh, just as a quick note to the discussion on warfing we just had, we all have to remember that CRMC just seemed to uh, have uh, mediated an approach to expanding in these type three waters. So. Uh, be a little um, awkward to suddenly have issues. But um, on this issue, on this topic, on this warrant, I think there have been really two big comments I've heard lately and we've been discussing tonight. First, it's a lot of money. There's no question. And, and I think we all uh, acknowledge that. We all appreciate that. Uh, the, the purchase and sales agreement is contingent on a, an appraisal. And um, assuming that the land appraises uh, for that value, then it seems to be stated worth it. Uh, obviously, if it's lower, then the negotiations uh, kick in. Second thing that has been unique about this warrant uh, literally was before it was put on the warrant uh, and on the financial town meeting schedule, it was an hour before that it was voted on. So the process, the timing has been very, very tight for people. And, and I'm sorry for that. Um, it's a situation where the seller for, you know, is, is selling, made it available. Uh, and after long discussions, uh, the town council decided to put it on the financial town meeting. And, uh, and I'm glad about that, but it does mean that there's a lot of learning and compressed learning in a very short period of time. And I'm glad there's, you know, 30 plus people on this call and it's great to see the participation. Third thing I want to mention, and I, and I will say this is unique to this situation uh, to a great degree, is I think this is democracy in action. And I have personally no problem with uh, the, the council clearly is moving it forward to the financial town meeting, uh, but, but it's reflective, I think, that some council members um, aren't in support necessarily. And, that, and that's good. I mean, that's part of democracy, right? That's part of a discussion. And I think we put it up to the voters uh, to the best uh, of their knowledge. And I think it's our job and why I was so happy with Marianne's um, initial presentation is just getting the facts out there. Let's get the information out so that everybody can make their most informed uh, choice. And I, and I truly applaud that. Personally, I um, don't think that decisions are mutually exclusive. Uh, I think, you know, we all try and plan, but sometimes we have to react and, and reacting to me comes to when you've got a, an offer in front of you and, and you think it's the offer that's right uh, uh, for the town or in this case for the island as a whole. I happen to think it is, that's fine. Uh, that's my, my position, others may not, and that's also fine. Um, I do wanna bring up the economic development point of view that I think Claire, Sto uh, Claire uh, Costello brought up before and some other people. The harbor is a huge economic engine for Block Island. Uh, uh, I, when I was seven, six, 15 and 16, I washed the bathrooms at the oar. I cleaned them out. I carried the garbage out when it was the Block Island Marina. I know what those bathrooms were like then. I know what they're like now. Um, we, I believe, can help our economic engine uh, by having appropriate facilities. It's been in the comprehensive plan. What we are discussing has literally been in the comprehensive plan for now multiple um, years. And I think from an economic development point of view, this, the, the, the proposed, and again, it's not in this purchase to, to Andre's comment earlier, it would be have to be uh, funded later, is, is a ramp where aquaculture could come in, uh, kelp farming could haul out their kelp, et cetera, uh, which is tough in the ramps that uh, we have now. I think that, that, that this situation is something that is truly um, a, a once in a lifetime. I know uh, others may not agree with that. I think there's a situation that, you know, whether it's the economic engine in the harbor, whether it's residences being able to access and use it, whether it's the type three commercial waters, uh, there are not, just, there are very, very, very few lots um, that could even be available for this. I think this is a very important acquisition. And I do want to end with, with sort of a, a perspective of um, a family on Block Island and 
having been near and dear to Andy's way a lot lately, especially for a family to, you know, go out and go fishing from Andy's way or to take a boat out. That's a tough thing. Uh, it's not easy to, to, you know, even with the new proposed ramp that's going to go in there, uh, it's not easy to necessarily um, get a boat out there and do that. Kayaks are one thing, but I'm talking a boat, sailboat especially. Here, there's an opportunity for the sailing program at the school. Uh, more kids are enrolled in it than ever for kids who want to get out and use the pond and for the island to appreciate the open spaces that we have. So I just wanted to capture a couple of thoughts there. I look forward to a great financial town meeting on Monday night. I hope everybody will be there. Um, and I look forward to continued dialogue. Thank, Thank you. you, Andre. Thanks, Finn. Uh, any others? Any other comments on this? Anything from the council? Anything from the public? Barbara McMullen. Hi, Andre. Thank you. I just wanted to um, um, bring up something that uh, in response to Gail Paul's question earlier, the land trust had two engineering studies done recently, high level. They're not detailed engineering studies by race, um, coastal engineering, and by um, uh, for ecotones was the other one on the feasibility of, of putting docks out from this property. Both of them did a, a, an analysis of the, of the floor, if, if that's the proper term, to determine depths and whether or not docks were possible. Both concluded that they were. And I'm pretty sure we provided those to the council, but it was probably a couple months ago. So I'll make sure Marianne has them and she can put them up on the with all the other documents for this, so people can see what the what the potential availability is for docks and ramps and so on and so forth. Because both studies concluded that building a dock there was possible, um, particularly if you take into account that we can go across to uh, in front of Ball O'Brien as well, since the properties are owned by us as well. The second thing I just want to clarify the ownership structure of this, the, the way it's set up is the town will own the fee interest in the entire property. They will be the fee owner of this property. The land trust will have um, an easement, a conservation easement and recreational easement over the entire property. But that doesn't preclude, as we've said, putting housing, for example, in the harbors facilities and also in our management plan, I just wanna make it clear um, and in the easement that decisions about what will be done on the property will be mutual. It won't be the land trust dictating what the town can do, nor can the town just do what they wanna do. It'll be a mutual partnership to make sure that we can develop what we need to do. And then the final point I wanna make is those areas, as I think either Sven or someone pointed out, are not necessarily identifiable right now because we will have to look at the wetlands and make sure we understand the proper layout of where facilities can go. And again, we have the ability to use Wall O'Brien to, to make that more effective. And that's all I have, thanks. Thank you, Barbara, much appreciated. Anybody, anybody else? Anybody else have any questions on the purchase? Sam Bird, unmute Sam, star six. Star six. Go ahead, Sam. How's that? Perfect. Okay. We can hear I, mean, you I just wanted to chime. I'm sorry? We can hear you loud and clear. Oh, okay. I just wanted to chime in. Um, very quickly on a couple of issues. One is um, I thoroughly agree with the concept that this is an absolutely, a, this is a legacy issue. Um, one of the ways to think about it is, is as Sven said, and everybody said, yes, it's a lot of money, um, but it's a legacy issue. And in my experience, um, the price tag of legacy issues, legacy purchases like this is forgotten long before the positive effects um, 
cease to exist, if they ever cease to exist. 50 years from now, the town will be congratulating itself on, on the ownership of this if, if this goes through. And no one 50 years from now will have a clue what it cost or even what that cost was relative to the market at the moment. Um, I've seen this again and again and again in, uh, with uh, public architecture when I was restoring town halls, big elegant uh, 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 monuments to uh, public architecture that were built. And um, I went back and did historical research and there was always a long, litany in the in the uh, paperwork around those buildings about the outrageous cost um, yet a hundred years later the town was restoring the building and had a pride of ownership that outlasted that memory of the cost so I would just put it in that category the other thing is um, many 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 people have heard me say my little mantra which is that on Block Island sooner or later, every issue circles back to housing. Um, I couldn't agree more that housing is a fundamental um, issue here. Uh, it affects virtually everything. And I appreciate the concern, but I think that putting this project on one side of the scale and housing on the other side of the scale is the definitive false dichotomy. Um, we should have the courage and we should have the wherewithal to do both, uh, to tackle both issues. This is an opportunity that came along. It won't be repeated for decades, if ever. And if you pass on it, it's gone forever. So I would just toss those, those thoughts out. Thank you, Sam Bird. Anybody else, questions? about the project. Four three nine zero eight eight eight. Hi, Andre, Bill McComb. Um, a question, I, I think Ken had brought it up, you know, we were told that the Wall O'Brien property was going to be purchased for, you know, the Harbor Master and so forth. So is, am I to, led to believe that that plan is going to be abandoned as far as any facilities there? Anybody? Yeah, Bill. Uh, Andre? Martha, go ahead. Yeah, I may be the only person who was uh, involved in that um, on the board. I was on the council at the time. They, not, not the time of purchase, but at the time, um, the proposal for the harbor's facility uh, was defeated at financial town meeting. I mean, we did a poor selling job, but I think the problematic nature of the property was what really killed it out. I, I think the property has turned out really, really well, um, but I I think it's pretty much maxed out as far as building space goes. I don't, I'm not sure there's yeah. a whole lot of room left. A whole lot of that land is locked up um, under an easement and you can't build anything there. Again, I think, I think it's worked out really well. Um, I, I just don't think it's a, a realistic um, approach anymore. Maybe somebody else can better address that, but um, I just don't think it's land. Well, can, can I follow up with that, Andre? Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Well, my concern is this. At the time, that wasn't what was presented on the sale, and it was good reason we could expand and so forth. I hate to see us repeat ourselves um, with this you know, in the same situation here. We heard Ken talk about the about the depth and the rocks and where there's a channel and so forth. And um, so I, I guess I, I kind of preface this with, I have the utmost respect for a lot of people on the land trust and, and the nature conservative. I think they do a wonderful job. And I hate to see one pitted against the other. Um, I also can see the other side where, you know, whether it be housing or whether it be the employees that have been asked not to have raises or the senior committee, uh, the senior group not being funded and, and so on and so forth. I think that um, I think the real injustice here is that two weeks before a financial meeting, we're bringing a four and a half million dollar um, question to the floor 
And I don't believe this has been vetted. You know, I pushed for this meeting and, and I thank Sven for getting this going. Um, I can't tell you if it's a real good proposal or not, or, you know, I, I, other than, you know, from the land uh, trust perspective, I'm, I'm sure that it is. But I think that there should be a process that has to do with vetting this out all the way so we don't end up with the same situation like at um, the Ball O'Brien property. Now, at the end of the day, it, it, it may be, you know, but I think that to have one meeting, which is Zoom, we can't, we don't have, we don't have information in front of us. We don't have, you know, uh, concrete answers to things. Um, we could find ourselves in the same situation we were with the Ball O'Brien property. Now, on the other hand, that, that property may be, to the land trust and conservation, may be worth all of that money with no harbor master shack and so forth. But I just think from the council's perspective, I think you need to look at the totality of the, of um, all of the projects and, and where we're going. So I think it's really unfortunate that with a week, uh, five days or whatever it is for the financial meeting, we're being asked for four and a half million dollars when the council usually says, come to our work sessions, come to our meetings, be involved with the, with the input. So when you come to the financial meeting, you're informed. Um, and I, I just think that this is really unfortunate that's being done. So I think it, it does an injustice to the project either for or against. So thank you. I appreciate the time. Yes, thank you, Bill. Um, uh, I see Kate McConville. Kate McConville. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted, Harvard Master. Go ahead. I just wanted to thank Bill for saying that about the follow buying property. That was when I have been doing research on that. That was the reason why that property was purchased. And and here we still are without a harbor's facility. And I understand all of these other needs that the community has. Um, will we be included in this facility or or what is going to become of this property? And I want to support it because I need a place on the harbor. Um, I also support looking at the boat basin and looking at champlains and looking at these new owners and what can they provide for the department for us so um, again i would hate to see the property not be utilized for what it, it really should be used for and that's all i have to say thank you um and i think one thing that will should come out of this is a direct engagement with the boat base and, and the new owners of champlains um on this in case you know because the the your the harbor master facility should this pass um uh, at the financial town meeting is still is not in the budget until 2025 um so i think we should engage them now because they're building down there and the block and the block island boat basin has um already put plans forward uh for renovations to that building so you're 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 absolutely correct kate i think it's a two-pronged thing and we do recognize the need for you to have a home on the water it's just you know, here we are. I mean, and I will say that back, and maybe Martha can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but back when Ball O'Brien was purchased, that was the last commercial piece of property. On the, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, right. and, now, and now we're, we're buying another one. So um, with one, we're buying another lifetime, once in a lifetime opportunity. So um, again, I just, I just can't, I can't do it. Uh, four, six, four, two, two, three, one. Four six four two two three one. Start. There you go. Uh, this is Kristen Bauman again. Um, geez, I hate to offer my question now after such really beautiful, um, you know, comments from both Bill and Kate. Um, but just for my clarification, um, do those properties touch the potential purchase and Ball O'Brien? I, I, you know, we're talking about we can expand over and, and use the Ball O'Brien property and we'll be able. But I, I feel like the the Sam Peckham house, the Sam Peckham development is in between them. So my, my specific question is, do they touch and is that really reality? And I guess so my follow up to that would be, um, you know, sort of going back to what uh, Bill McComb just said, like, will there be diagrams at financial town meeting? Will there be information? Can, will we be able to visualize this? 
Um, will will there what what kind of information will be at fin financial town meeting um, about this warrant question? Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I can't have any. I don't have any answer to that, Marianne Crawford. I see your hands up, and then seven four one five one three six. And we do have to start thinking about wrapping up this meeting. We do have a zoning at six. We do have some time, but um, I'm, I don't want to cut anybody short. I just want to make sure everybody knows um, that we are getting to that point. Uh, seven four one five one three six. Oh, Marianne, go ahead. Just a couple of things, really quickly. Um, <clears throat> The frontage is, um, someone, Argale asked about the frontage on the water, it's 124 feet. The other thing I wanna remind the council, uh, some time ago, um, the, the uh, folks that are um, managing the boat, basement, boat basin did come before you and they are uh, reconstructing that uh, building down there. There will be space for a harbor office there. And also they are renovating the restrooms and also will be having, as a as I understand it, coin operated uh, restrooms for the public there also, that they would be looking for us to uh, participate in those. So I just wanted to remind the council, they did come to you folks. It was soon after I started. Um, so you may not have remember that specifically and um, they will be coming back to you folks probably in late summer, early fall. Thank you, Marianne. 741536. Star six to unmute, identify yourself and let us know what's on your mind. Hi, it's Henry DuPont. And uh, to answer a couple of the questions, because I was on the town council when um, some of this started and we're looking towards developing a harbors facility and the ball O'Brien Park seemed like a great idea. Sadly, if you walk out behind the tennis courts, there's a, a narrow rocky path down to the beach and it's very steep and it would be impossible to provide vehicular access from the, the level part of the Ball O'Brien property down to the beach. And, and uh, so uh, we just couldn't provide a facility. And to answer the other question about the Salt Pond settlement, those condos only go halfway to the water and the property line is right is is 25 feet um northeast of the last condo there so that makes the overlook lot and the ball o'brien uh lot um uh contiguous from the very last condo all the way down to the water which is a couple of hundred feet so, so there's plenty of room to use the northwest side of the Ball O'Brien part with access from the overlook lot, which you couldn't get on the Ball O'Brien uh, lot by itself. And yeah. I hope that answers those questions. Thank you, Henry. And there's, Andre? All, there's hang on one second, Martha. Hi. Hang on one second, Martha. There's also an easement um, that gives the, uh, the users of Ball O'Brien uh, uh, salt pond settlement um, access to the water. Mm -hmm. Martha, go ahead. Five seven. Yeah, I was only going to. I got you. Go ahead, Martha. I was only going to. Clarify, I was only going to clarify what you just said. That that bound is encumbered by an easement uh, from Peckham's to the shore, from uh, Salt Pond Settlement to the shore. Uh, I think there's some provision in the agreement about putting a bridge or a boardwalk or, or something to uh, a walk over. I'm not sure what it is. I don't remember exactly. I only got these a very short time ago. But but it is encumbered by a, a deed of easement. Thank you very much, Martha Ball. Um, Mark, hold on one second. Five seven eight two nine eight nine has been waiting for a little while. Star six to unmute. Let me know, you know identify yourself and let us know what's on your mind. Yeah, Andre. Yes. It's Chris Littlefield. Um, Littlefield. I had a question about what the towns. Uh, if the town goes ahead with this, what what the uh, per taxpayer cost would be? Marian? Um, I know there's $137 per million. I think Amy Lind is on the call. I, I don't want to put on the spot if she doesn't have it. I think it may have been in the document that was forwarded to the council some time ago. Yes. Um, so... 
Amy's here and I'll let Amy's her here. run with it. Sure, I'll just give you a slightly longer sentence. Um, $137 annually is the estimated cost for a property valued at $1 million. Um, so obviously you can scale up or down from there uh, depending on on your own property. On your own property. So, and then, so it would be, so be 4.2, is it 4.2 that the town's being asked to come up with? 4.5. So 4.5 times 137. So if I'm doing the math correctly, it's around $600. Um, I think that that's a great investment for everybody in the community. Um, Chris, I'm going to stop you there. <laughs> Don't multiply. Just $137 if your property is worth a million dollars. So okay. um, <laughs> if your property is oh, worth okay. $2 so million... It, so dollars, It'd be two hundred seventy-four dollars annually. Or if, if I can build on that, if you're a renter uh, and the value of that apartment's five hundred thousand, it would be about seventy dollars. Exactly. Okay. All right. So I was going in the wrong direction. <laughs> That's why we're here. Anyway, that, it sounds like a good sounds like a good deal to me. And I also wanted to. Um, I wasn't able to hear everything that Bill Landry said, but. We asked Joe Priestley for um, an analysis of what could be done on the property with no restrictions. This is on the, the piece that's to be subdivided from the overlook. And Joe, Joe said that, um, that nine, he thought that nine rather large townhouses could be built. Or also that a, a 30,000 square foot footprint building could be built on that property. Um, additionally, what folks aren't considering here at all, I haven't heard anybody say this about in terms of the health of the pond, but um, when you have property next to a resource such as Great Salt Pond that is either in natural cover or is properly developed with all the latest state-of-the-art uh, techniques to keep pollution from entering the pond there's a there's a value there that that kind of transcends this economic argument um and we should be we should be protecting the watershed of great salt pond and the shoreline of great salt pond whenever we have an opportunity and that that's a value that that um unfortunately has been lost in this conversation but i i wanted to point that out thank you Thank you very much, Chris. The reason I asked, I, and thank you for bringing that up. The reason I asked uh, Bill Andrew to be here is because um, I, I remember um, in that meeting, I, I was the one who asked Joe Priestley uh, what could be put there. And the answer, the answer to that I have in my notes was that it's, um, um, the, we're buying approximately 73,000 square feet and 20,000 square foot feet was a developable lot. This is the answer that I got. So only three units could be, could be, could have been put there. That's what was said in the meetings. So, uh, you know, I get what Bill Landry said and, um, and I, again, see the literature that says, says nine. So, um, you know, I was told three in a meeting I'm hearing, I'm, I'm reading nine now. And that's why I asked Bill Landry here to quantify and, and, um, and answer that question. Robert? Can I just clarify that, um, Andre, in the meeting when um, uh, Joe mentioned three units, he was talking about the 1.75 acre development area, plus or minus. He was not talking about the open space area. The open space area is where the nine units come from. In, in the development area, the question I think came up about that had, was related more to how much housing could be added to that and part of developing the facilities. So the, the three just refers to the 1.75 plus or minus development area. Thank you for, for adding to that knowledge. Sure. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, Mark. We have to wrap this up, Mark, so I'm going to give you the last comment. We got a zoning meeting coming in in 20 minutes. All right, Henry, thank 
Thank you for ask, answering Christine's first question about contiguous lots. But the second question she had was would some kind of white paper or at least something conceptual be available on the night of the town financial meeting to uh, address or simplify this issue? Mary Ann, will we have something provided that night? Um, we can look into it. I, I have to check with the clerks and see what documents she has prepared for um, the, the financial town meeting. We can have what was put up on clerk base, all the copies of the easements and things of that nature, if we like. I wouldn't make copies of the appraisal because it's, right. it's pretty voluminous, but we can have the management plan. We can have the purchase and sales agreement, and the purchase and sales agreement has some maps that are associated with that. And in closing, thanks, Chris. Chris Littlefield, we're presenting plan A to you. Chris brought up something that would be plan B. And we all know what plan B could be. So keep that in mind too, as you scratch your head and ponder your decision on this. And lastly, is that we started this, these discussions months ago and it took a long time and a lot of extra meetings most of them sadly in closed session, but that's how something like this has to proceed. Nothing was underhanded. <laughs> Unlike what's taken naturally, uh, nationally, compromises were made on both sides to get to the point we did. And it happened to be at the 11th hour. And that's the reason for the time period that we're working with. That nothing, nothing left-handed was done to get to the point we're at. Unfortunately, it came at this late date. Thank you, Mark. Um, I do have to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second by Sven. All these in favor. Keith? Yes. Sven? Yes, and thank you to everybody that was here. Mark? Aye. Martha? Aye, and when is the town meeting, Andre? Please remind everyone. <laughs> Did you get a text from Molly? Did Molly <laughs> <laughs> the financial town meeting is Monday, May 3rd, 2021 at 7 p.m. To participate, you must be present and register to vote in the town of New Shoreham. The meeting will be at the school. Enter through the gym doors by the playground. Please come early. Check-in begins at 6.30. Your check-in with the Board of Canvassers will go faster with a driver's license. You must wear a mask. Cheers in the gym will be set up for this year's COVID-19 rules. 200 feet, 250 people indoors if seated six feet apart. There will be some double seating for folks in the same household. We will keep the gym doors open for ventilation, so please dress appropriately. We will have outdoor seating for overflow or for those who are uncomfortable in a large indoor group. Please bundle up. Non-voters will be seated in the hallway. We ask that people go directly to their seats and maintain social distancing before, during, and after the meeting. The meeting will be broadcast as a courtesy, but you must be present to participate. Financial Town Meeting will be broadcast on Zoom in the Town of New Shoreham's YouTube channel as a courtesy. This is not a legal requirement, and there will be no way for you to comment or participate remotely, so everybody who would like to vote at the Financial Town Meeting must be... Motion, motion to adjourn has been made, seconded and voted on. Um, I appreciate um, everybody's input this evening, and I think we will be seeing you on Monday night. Appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.